Why, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to another week of the Dank Hour. We are on, um, going to be on hiatus next week for just a little while, so don't miss out on that one, but we are going to leave with a bang, that is for sure. We have an amazing guest with us today, Jeremy Warren, um, and and really, we're going to have a lot of fun conversations and, and, and see. We have pretty much the full crew with us tonight. Um, hopefully, everybody's doing well, enjoying the thing. Hopefully, Johnny's doing good. I know he's been picking up at the at the farm a little bit more. Things are going a little bit faster than he planned. But again, we're going to be away next week for just a little bit. Um, so don't go anywhere and, and maybe watch some of the other content because you might need to rewatch some of our previous episodes. They're pretty intense. You might need to rewatch this one because we got an amazing... Amazing guest with us today, Jeremy Warren. Welcome to the Dank Hour. Um, looking forward to, to chatting with you this evening. Cool. Thanks for having me. Look, looking forward to the show. Awesome. Do you want to do you want to start just by some people that might not know you? We have a pretty international audience. Some people that might not know you exactly what you do, where you're from, what your background is. Give me the give me the the elevator pitch, Jeremy Warren kind of preview for people to get to know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm Dr. Jeremy Warren. I'm a director of plant science for Dark Heart Nursery. I've been with Dark Heart about four years now in the cannabis industry, about six total now. So not as much as some of the faces in here, but, uh, you know, it goes by so quickly. <laughs> it's it's pretty crazy. Um, I was, you know, did a lot of work here at Dark Heart on genetics and plant science. So we, we are the group that discovered hop lane viroid causes cannabis dutting disease in cannabis shoot it's been at least four or five years now since we first broke that news we can definitely spend some time chatting about that as it's back in the news once again uh it seems to be somewhat cyclical when people realize they have it uh also you know released some of the first uh triploid or seedless cannabis varieties into the industry industry so working with polyploidy and love to talk about that a bit and you know we've got a lot of other stuff going on lab we have plenty of topics but you know i'm really excited about cannabis as a plant, especially as like a factory and these, the cool sorts of molecules it can make. So that's kind of a, a long-term goal of mine uh, to utilize the plant to its fullest. My, I have my, my children and wife and beautiful family have awesome, awesome, awesome timing because it's like right at bedtime. So just one second. <laughs> can I say hi? No, you gotta go. Good night, ciao, ciao. <laughs> Say good night, ciao, ciao. So they're, they're going to bed. Sorry. Snug time. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. I have two kids too. That's why I'm at the lab still. It's, it's a little quieter. Uh, <laughs> you know that we travel like a lot, and uh, we we well, especially over the last little bit, we're gonna get settled in Croatia for the next year. Um, but we've been running all over the place, but we don't get to like get settled for the next like two months still. So we're still running all over the place. So I'm like set up in a living room with a TV that you might be able to hear. Hopefully I, I set up the microphone so you can't hear so badly. Uh, so, I, I mean, did I'm, I'm going to throw the ball over to Tess first and just kind of get, get it rolling because you perked up some interest. And I know that there's a conversation point here to get started with. And and, and as, as everybody knows, we just like to have a, a good old chat. So what, what's up, Tess? How you doing? You know, how you doing? Great. What am I? What am I? What am I? Who, who, who am I? What the fuck is that? Okay, go ahead. How's it going? <laughs> it's like when you were like coming up with all the cool like uh, names for yourself, and once you were like dictator of dialogue, and you're like, maybe not that one. <laughs> I ruined my intro for my whole life from that one. Like, I it was it was so good. I did the same intro for a year, and I ruined it that day. It was brutal. <laughs> Well, it's really a pleasure, Jeremy, to have you on and chat with you about all things nerdy and cannabis and probably a bunch of other random stuff, too. But um, I think it's just so fascinating that you guys were the first to really identify hoplite and viroid. I'm a microbiologist and also an RNA um, molecular biologist. So I love these little bits and pieces of RNA that are on the verge of life, but not really alive that can either come in the form of viruses that actually code for things or viroids that don't really code for anything. They just sort of make copies of themselves. And I just wanted to kind of like get your story of like how you first started, you know, first, what are viroids um, and how are they 
kind of unique in this instance? And then how, like, what was really tipping you off? I, I'd love to learn more about that, like, that, like, aha moment where you're like, holy crap, there's this little parasitic RNA that's messing with my plants. Yeah, definitely. That's a good question, right? Because I definitely wasn't the first to see the symptoms of <laughs> hoplite and viroid cannabis studying in the industry, right? So even before I started working on it, it's been described in Humboldt probably like five to 10 years before that is causing issues. You know, the, the names are always fun, like the itis, the herp, like yellowhead, dudding. If you ask around, there's some pretty fun ones. I'm trying to create a list. If you guys have heard anything else, love to hear those as well. I think um, realistically, so little work had been done. Dr. Crum up there had been doing some work and had tested for some of the usual suspects like, uh, you know, TMV, a bunch of the other multi-host viruses that are that are in, you know, and can affect a lot of crops, but coming up with blanks, right? So since I knew that, you know, I think I just took a moment to, you know, thought about the tools that we had that haven't been used yet, right? And so RNA sequencing is one of those tools, it's just what it sounds like. You can take anything alive, <laughs> grind it up, kind of morbid there, but, and then throw it through some machines and it'll tell you everything that's alive in there, right? Because everything that's alive produces RNA at some point in its life cycle. So, if you want to use that technology, a little expensive, but it will give you a clear picture on what's what's in each plant. So the, the next step is pretty much, hey, look, we've got all these infected plants that are doing poorly. These other ones are super healthy. And so next obvious step is grind each of those groups up and see what you come up with. Right. So that's what we did. Luckily, it was very clear. All the infected ones we picked out, uh, you know, had RNA for hoplite and viral in them. And all of the healthy ones had no RNA for hoplite and viral in them. So that's great, right? That's a, what we call association. So now we've associated a pathogen or a disease with, you know, what we're seeing in the field, but we haven't shown causation yet, right? So there's Koch's postulates. It's this thing they do in human, human medicine, right? To show that which pathogen causes which disease. And so you do the same thing with, with plants. So you take an infected plant, you isolate that virate in pure culture. It's a little different because it's RNA. Uh, take it, put it into a healthy plant, and hopefully it reproduces the symptoms. And then once again, if it is producing the symptoms, you're able to re-isolate it and show us the same thing. So we went through that whole process with uh, hoplite and viral. It's a little more complicated because as Tess said, it's not alive, can't replicate itself. It's a little trickier to do that than with like a bacteria or fungi. So once we did that and showed that it was actually causing symptoms, now you can develop a test. Now you can work on curing it. And now, you know, as a nursery at the time, now you can tell people like, hey, we know it's causing all these problems. We're actively testing for it and trying to get it out of, out of you know, everybody's genetics, really. Awesome. I love that being up. Yeah, I'm so curious because the research has come such a far way. It's nice to see you, Jeremy. I feel like we did a, like it was a couple years ago when it was first more starting to become an issue in the industry. And I'm really curious. I'm always following the news around, um, you know, what the current research is. And I'm just curious, you know, based on the research and studies that you guys have been doing over time, how has the, you know, the practices changed? Like what's changed in 2023 as far as how we've learned to deal with it? I've heard more recently people suggesting if you do end up with positive tests that not necessarily culling those plants, whereas previously it was like, you know, this very much like cull everything and just more on like a practical level for viewers, like how are you seeing those, um, you know, what are you suggesting to people at this point? Yeah, very good question. At the start, everybody just suggested that I had spread and caused the disease and that <laughs> everything was my fault. So I'm glad we've kind of moved on from that sort of perspective uh, to other ones that was naturally occurring in, in nature, uh, not created by me. I think, you know, it really depends on what you're doing for a business, right? Like if you're a breeder, and you're looking for maybe to breed some resistance for hoplite and viroid. Obviously, you're going to want to keep some plants around. You're going to want to see what genetics do well and don't do well as far as different virate titers and like get some ideas about what strains might be more resistant and be able to you know tolerate the the viroid more than others. And I think we do see that, right? We do see some strains that do fairly well. And they'll test positive. Other strains do terribly. And so. 
then you take the next step, like nurseries pretty much have like a zero tolerance, right? You know, you can't be sending folks any viral infected plants. So if you're in the nursery game, you really like, unless it's like you're also doing breeding, you really want to try to cull anything that's positive because it's just a huge risk factor for spreading to your clean strains, especially if you're in the, in, in the, in the process of actually getting it cleaned up. It can really set you back. The, now, the, where we see what you just mentioned here, where people are like, maybe don't throw it away, maybe keep it around, is in a production environment, you know, you might not just be able to throw everything away, right? You got to pay the bills, you got to get a crop, you got to, you know, keep everybody working. So, you know, oftentimes groups in that category kind of come with a hybrid strategy, right? They throw out as many infected plants as they can to get the infection rate down as much as possible. But maybe, you know, especially some strains that can do a little better, they'll keep those around and just be extra careful that they know that the virus is infecting those plants and that uh, due care <laughs> is needed. You know, as a nursery, we have a zero policy, except for our breeding program. We just kill it all once we find it. Just to follow up really quickly on that question, because I feel like there's a lot of misinformation out there around best practices and also around testing, because... I feel like I, you know, I just have been encouraged for so long that people don't purchase from nurseries that aren't testing and making sure you're asking those questions that there's third party testing. Um, and I think there's a lot of people thinking like, oh, you test once and there's, you know, um, it's uh, a latent viroid. So obviously, uh, you know, I think this frequent testing. So what would you recommend for um, kind of like a safe standard throughout like an annual cycle, what would you recommend for people to be the amount of times they should be testing? Yeah, extremely good question. I think, you know, from our perspective, we assume everything that's coming into our nursery is infected. And so even if someone tells us it's been tested a bunch and it's totally clean, our stuff's, you know, we never had it. That's not always the case. So, you know, having just a small quarantine program in place, just where you bring new genetics in, you test them when they come in, if possible. Like if you're just doing a whole grow, maybe pick a few plants out and see where you stand, right? But especially if you're bringing new material from other block, you're going to want to do those tests yourself uh, just to confirm. And if you've been working with someone a long time, maybe you can scale that back a little. But definitely if you're trying out new plant suppliers. And then realistically, like, you know, we can never prove a negative in science. We can never tell you your plant is clean. We can only tell you if it has the virus, right? So it's important to know. And latent, as you brought up, makes everything four times harder. Like, I'd love it if we tested a plant once and we knew it was infected or not, right? But that's, with this virus, it's just not the case. And so what we suggest to people is to test three or four times if you're bringing new genetics in, especially from other stock. Um, and generally speaking, from our experiences, like, if you do that over the course of a month and a half or two months, test it three or four times, you might have one in 200 or like maybe like one in 100 escape, right, that you missed. And so that that's kind of speaks to the ongoing testing program to make sure you get that, right? So that's pretty, 99% is pretty good, but it's not 100, right? So you just got to be cognizant of you can do these tests, you can do it three or four times, but you want to kind of keep up with that maintenance testing just so nothing surprises you down the road. Does it impact the chemistry of the trichome at all? I mean, I know it hits yields and makes the plants look not very nice, like they should look. But I mean, um, yes. <laughs> so if you're buying, if you're buying hundreds of pounds of trim, how do you know that inside that bag there wasn't um, uh, infected plant material? I mean, it, there's is that plenty hard? of stuff. Sorry to talk over you there. Yeah, there's plenty no, 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 of please. stuff. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good point, right? So Dr. Punja, who's also done some work on the virus, just published a paper that has some really great pictures of trichomes and trichome morphology from infected plants. Um, definitely scope it out because there are differences. And now whether that's just sick plant trichomes or 100% caused by the virus, that's, you know, we can debate that point. But I think, you know, they're generally, if your plants are really poorly infected, like 20% yield loss is normal, right? Like, and for certain strains like THC and cannabinoid percent is also down like 20%, right? There's a bit of variation on strains there. So I don't want to say that's all encompassing, but um, if you want to see pictures of, he, he did some good electron microscope uh, photos and you can check it out. There's definitely a difference in the, the size and the morphology of them for sure. But need, 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 needless to say, I mean, we're in an agricultural commodity market where people are selling hundreds and hundreds of pounds of material 
from the uh, statistics I've seen, there's way higher infection rate than people really truly understand. So there's likely that in the supply chain itself, going to processors making oils and concentrates and vape pens and whatnot, are basically processing infected material. Don't, don't you think? I mean, just 100%. Yeah, I've nature. seen warehouses full of viral infected material they can't sell because the numbers aren't high enough, right? And so I don't think it's a stretch. I'm not saying anybody does this, but I wouldn't think it was a stretch for maybe people to mix some of that in with some of the good stuff, right? To get it out of the <laughs> and send it to extract. So, so can you repeat what you, you just said, just so I understand what you're saying? What you're saying is that is that the potency is hit so hard that there's warehouses full of plant material that can't be sold? Is that is that what you just said? Especially early on. Absolutely. Yeah. Because the THC percent gets knocked down so far. There's just like it's tons. Just we just sitting there, right? That's it's a lot of money. Bad day. So I wanna give the floor to Anna. So hey Jeremy. Um, I have multi part question. So, well, number one, like all this stuff sitting around that may or may not have been infected that people are trying to sell. I want to just let people know, like the thyroid is not harmful to people. If you're, <laughs> like, if you're smoking or eating, you know, the hoplite and thyroid infected plant material, don't freak out. It's not going to get you sick. Right. It just, infects although you. there are a thyroid like, <laughs> kind of organisms that do infect humans but, but i digress right so one, not this one. One. you're gonna scare people if you tell them what it is <laughs> i don't want people to like freak out thinking that you know like they should worry about you know infected plant material harming them first of all second of all okay so a lot of this conversation around hoplite and viroid and statistics and you know how many plants are infected is really centered around like large operations. And I've seen a lot of home growers who are very concerned about what do I do? Like at home, like how do I stop if I've only got, you know, a six plant or a 12 plant uh, home grow max, how can I make sure that my plants are protected? Um, like what's a good quarantine regimen? Like where do I get my plants? If I see it, what should I do? Because I, you know, like back in the day, which I believe was 2017, I got a strain called white on white. And the person who gave it to me was like, we think it might have this variegation pattern because it's been, it's got this hit hop late and fired, which back then it like wasn't a thing, right? It, but this plant performed very well and had beautiful flowers. It wasn't a problem. So this is like two different tangents I'm going off on. <laughs> And, and, and so like, there could be some plants that are not so terribly impacted by hop latent viroid while others are very, very impacted. So can you close two homes and then. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. The first one, thank you for bringing up the viroid is, does, does not trying to have any effect on people. Right. I think there's, I don't think there is a virus or a virus that's been shown to uh, cross Across, you know kingdoms like that so <laughs> people are safe if you happen to have uh some weed with virus in it it's going to be fine for you that, that seems bad it's going to happen to you you might have a little lower potency and some fewer terps but it's not you know no, no ill health benefits there for sure um and then the second part you brought up another sort of couple questions the first one is as a home grower how do i know if my plants are clean right and realistically you're not going to have the budget to test <laughs> your plants for the virus Right. So do a little research, look online about the, you know, if you're buying clones, especially look online for the clones you're able to purchase and see what, if their websites even talk about hoplite and viral and if they test, right. That's always a good first. I think, you know, especially in California, most of the nurseries here are testing, which is good, but that's not necessarily true throughout the U S. So always do a first step there. And then also, if you can't source clean genetics, you know, the seed transmissibility, unfortunately there is seed transmissibility, um, but it's much lower, right? So we're thinking like five to 10% range. We've done a lot of studies there. So you might have a slightly higher chance if you don't have a reputable clone uh, dealer to buy your home grow stuff of popping some seeds, right? But it's still not zero. And then, you know, as a home grower, like if you look at some of the blogs are out there, the, the veg uh, sometimes are always a little trickier, but you can catch it pretty early. And, you know, replacing one plant 
is not so bad in the grand scheme of things. But just be aware, like do what we do in the industry, right? Uh, either have one printer per plant or in, disinfect your printers with like 10% bleach between cutting your plants. And if you can do that, if you have one that has it, just keep it from spreading. And it's also carried in the water, right? So if you like come home and put all your clones or whatever into all the same water and one of your plants is infected, you're going to infect. It's kind of like a chicken pox party, right? Yeah, that's a very good point. And so like people forget the cloning stage when they're talking about the virus a lot. Like, well, I'm doing the pruning really well, but then you'll talk to them and like, well, yeah, I set all my clones on the same table, use the same razor blade, and they all go in the same base of water, right? And so definitely going to have virus spread. If you've got a bunch of clones in a container and you shove infected and healthy ones in there, that's like a super easy way to spread the virus around. I know Poon just, just reported a little bit of uh, research around like shared water baths, like the aero cloners for sure. You can spread stuff around there, but maybe even like some hydroponic plants in like in a system with some spread there. I think for a home grower, that's just a big deal. I think if you're purifying your water as a commercial grower, like we haven't seen it be like a huge uh, amount of spread, like especially if you're testing the other sanitation, but it's definitely not zero. Yeah. That's just crazy Jeremy. to me as an RNA person. Like, oh yeah, sorry about that. Um, but RNAs usually are, are, I mean, when you are working with RNA in the laboratory, you can look at your sample wrong and it'll degrade. Like you're like, no, my RNA is all gone. But because it's much less stable than DNA, which really forms the backbone of our genetic code, but that DNA is made into RNA, that RNA has a certain half-life in the cell. It's sort of that messenger for most things. There are exceptions. But um, so when we think about the stability of these circular RNAs, because that's what gives it some of the stability, right? It doesn't have an end to be chewed up on because that's how many of these um you know, nucleic acids are chewed up is by one end or the other. And so because they're circular, they're even more stable. The fact that this, these RNA molecules can survive in water for like days and who knows how long. And even when you go and test weed that's been dried and cured that you can buy the dispensary, they're still testing positive for these viroids. And those viroids can still infect plants, which is just... Pfft, it just blows my mind that they're still that they're so stable. What do you think is unique about this as a as a plant pathogen that other things like molds and and bacterial pathogens uh, you don't have to contend with? So what do you think is like unique about this? that's extra extra challenging. Yeah, I think what's unique is that uh, since the humans are the uh, major vector for this, it's one of the few you can exclude. Right. So if you do your due diligence and you work and you uh, do all your testing, it's one of the few where if you go under steps about how to control pathogens, number one is exclude. Right. And we can do that with the viroid for sure. Now, if it's in there, you're right. Like the double strand and all the structures it makes make it super hard to break up. So it's uh, it's it's definitely a wild sort of uh, pathogen in that regard. Jeremy, I got a quick question. You mentioned before that people at home can't afford to do a test. How, how much should this test cost? I see prices all over the place from these testing labs. Yeah, I think starting off, you know, it was like $25 a test, but now you're getting down to like $15 or so a test or less, especially folks at volume. So I, we've seen the prices drop dramatically <laughs> over the last few years, for sure. Yeah, I mean, can Compared to doing potency or full panel COAs, that's a drop in the bucket, right? I mean, that's not really a, a huge cost. Yeah, and it's surprising why more people don't just do it, right? Because it's not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things. Yep. Is that like a, a PCR kit to read hot plate and virus infection? Yeah, we use QRT PCR in our lab, just like COVID, right? So all those tests, but there's some commercially available PCR based tests, and it has to be. You know, genetic-based tests of LAMP, PCR, you know, RFOP, something like that. So I want to, I want to, you did a whole episode on, on this the other day on our channel, didn't you? <laughs> For like a whole day. So I want to just like segue off of this as quickly as possible. I'm going to throw it, throw Annie to get with, with like, um, she wants to chat and, and ask a couple of questions, maybe about polyploids. So um, go ahead, Dr. I do. I was going to say, 
Jeremy, you talk like people just want to talk about hop late and all the time. It seems like these days, and there's so much more to your like breadth and depth of knowledge in terms of plants and cannabis. And I am super interested in polyploids. I uh, always have been. I don't particularly want to work with them as a geneticist, like throwing in the polyploid, like, you know, multiple sets of chromosomes really screws up like the kind of work that I do, but they're super interesting. And, um, you know, as we all see on all of the various social media, like platforms that we're on, people often put up things with faciation and they go, oh, it's a polyploid. It's not. Uh, polyploids in general are not like if you're just looking at a plant, you would be able to say like, oh, that's a polyploid unless you were taking like data. But anyway, I know that Dark Heart uh, has a line of polyploid genetics that are available now, like they're triploid, right? And so they're sterile. And the idea is that if you, you can grow them outside and if a diploid hemp plant that's grown outside is happens to be around and you get some pollination, nothing you're not going to get seeds because they're not compatible so i brushed up on my poly polyploid spin my head i always get wrapped like i just i can't i can never figure it out I have to draw a picture so i want to hear from you i send her random polyploid. photos just like here's what, <laughs> yes. what do you think I this guy's like just screw <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah so definitely. i would love, love to hear about polyploids for sure. I would just say ploidy around here because it's easier and <laughs> not as much of a tongue tire. Um, I think, yeah. So, I mean, everybody's dealing with, uh, you know, polyploids in their daily life. Um, watermelons, bananas, there's a, a lot of fruits and vegetables you eat. Uh, strawberries are octoploid, right? You eight copies. Um, and Richard Philbrook, who did a lot of the work in the ploidy in our lab is, you know, he's on a personal mission to separate fatiation from polyploidism and, and under, help people understand there's a difference between those two things. Um, but just at a, at a you know high level, uh, cannabis is like people, right? We each have two copies of each of our chromosomes. So we call that two in. And so, you know, you're able, plants naturally can be at a number of different uh, levels of two in. It can be two in, four in, up to eight in and beyond. We can go crazy like 12 and all these crazy copies, right? So, you know, early on, like decades ago, people figured out that, you know, if you have a watermelon that's four in, so four copies of each chromosome, and you cross it with a watermelon that's two in, you get to see this watermelon you enjoy in the store, right? And so that resulting cross is a three in or a triploid. And so obviously this is very useful in crops that you don't want to have uh, seeds in. But, you know, as, as you look at watermelons, it's not 100 percent seedless. I think we can all agree there. There's a few here and there, but it greatly re reduces your risk in, you know, inadvertent pollen flying around um, your crops, just seeding everything. Right. And there's been, uh, you know, instances of, you know, disgruntled employees putting a mail plant outside the place they got fired from to seed crops. Right. So it is a real <laughs> risk and people are dealing with it all the time. And so I think you know that that part of it is very exciting. I think from our perspective in the lab, what excites us most about polyploids, especially triploids, is the, the ability to stack traits uh, in, in like intentional ways. Right. Because you'll have two copies of one trait and one of another. Right. From each of the parents. And so. There's some really cool, interesting ways you can combine two plants in that system to really show off certain traits over others, which you couldn't do in like a two in a diploid background, right? And so we're very, you know, that's one of our goals here is to see what kind of cool genetics we can pull out in a triploid background to really kind of showcase some of the uniqueness of different cannabis genetics. Go for it, Anna. <laughs> you're muted, sorry. You're, you're muted. You're <laughs> muted, by the way. Can I go and work for you? That sounds like yeah. so up my alley. Like, that sounds amazing. No, it's super. I mean, everybody here is very excited about it, right? I mean, I think it's like yeah. there's different parts of every genetic people really like, right? And to be able to kind of pick those parts from different parents and like, oh, like show one more than the other. Right. That's what we're we're very excited about. I think, you know, we've made up to like eight 
in cannabis. It doesn't not happy really past six. So I think most of the stuff we'll see. The tetraploids grow slower, but the triploid seems to be a good spot. There's some other groups that have shown maybe some, we're not ready to say this quite yet, but there does appear to be some yield increases working in that triploid background. And Richard Philbrook, who works for us, he, you know, was the first person to discover that there's natural triploids in cannabis, right? So this isn't something that's created in the lab. This happens naturally. Like MAC1 is a natural triploid. Hades OG, one of the ones that we picked from a phenol hunt is natural. There's a couple others. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's they're out there and uh, they're those are some pretty good crosses that have won phenol hunt. So I think there's something there's, to this um, sort of thought. There's also a natural population. I always want to say it's Russia, but don't quote me on that. And there's a paper on it, but the, they, and it's tetraploid. It's a tetraploid population. And they did sampling from that and they found that. Um, this tetraploid population just in general was less successful in terms of, you know, germination and just successful, you know, being a population. It just wasn't, it doesn't perform as well as, as the diploids. So, you know, people have this idea that a tetraploid or, you know, an octoploid, like it's going to be so much bigger and produce so much more THC and like, it's going to be awesome, but it doesn't really work that way nope. in most cases right so i've seen an oct octoploid cannabis plant and it's, it was not a happy plant at all they're they're not they're <laughs> sad yeah i mean that's the original thought right like the reason like wheat and some of these are crops and you get these huge strawberries is the when you step up that ploidy you step up those traits as well but in cannabis it doesn't seem like you're stepping up to thc in that linear fashion like with other crops and you're not stepping up total yields right so i think uh you know, I'm sure people are sad about that, but that's just the world we're going to work in as far as barley polyploids and cannabis. For sure. I'd love to yeah. chime in. I've been very curious about, um, I've actually grown some triploids and something I noticed, um, I think it's fascinating just first out of out the gate. I think it's super fascinating. I've always been kind of drawn to like the freaks and the mutants in the, um, in cannabis, just in general. I've, I don't know. I love when plants do weird things. So very curious about that. And I'm in Southern Oregon and over the years we really have, especially with the whole, um, you know, hemp and the adult use kind of battling. And then I think we've kind of bred our own version of ditch weed here. And there's been a lot of, um, a lot of pollen. So that was part of my intrigue initially with um, triploids was we do have so much rogue pollen and that also in a lot of indoor facilities, you know, with the uns um, unstable genetics, it just seems like it's kind of a fact of life with a lot of these more kind of hypey, um, less stabilized genetics, the seeds are kind of a fact of life. And unless you've had like acres of, you know, cannabis seeded, you don't fully understand the crop loss because nobody, you know, nobody wants that product. So, I mean, I have so many questions about um, triploids, but one of my observations in the seeds was I felt like the seedlings and I just felt like the plants did not, I was really anticipating, you know, kind of on a lot of the hype that it was going to be like, and these were not from their, uh, from them, just for the record. Um, I feel like they just, they, I feel like there was like a struggle to thrive um, a little bit with the plants. And I know there is a lot of that hype out there that they have, you know, higher, they're more robust plants, they can be bigger plants, they can have higher um, chemical um, or cannabinoid profiles, and that they have more stress tolerance. And I just, I'm curious, you know, when you talk about that stacking function, or like where maybe, where are maybe some of the risks or, um, you know, where's the downside? Because I, I am curious. I'm like, are they truly going to be a superior? I see where the function could be served. But also, like, um, I'm just, I have yet to see that really the vigor part kind of show up in, um, I guess, in the proof. So You're I'm not a believer in the plea? I'm a believer. I think they're cool. I just am <laughs> curious, like, about the... Um, like, what are the challenges, I guess? You know, like, yeah. where are the challenges in breeding? It's like a new thing, right? So I know that there's supposed to be more stability also because, I mean, it's very valuable for people to be able to have something that can be purely seedless because that's what consumers want. 
Yeah, no, you're on the right. You're, you're, I think your intuition is correct here, right? Just because I think what's important to realize just because it's a triple aid doesn't mean it's automatically better <laughs> than everything else, right? So, um, just as with every cross, if you're not crossing the two right things to make your triple aid, you could get a very mediocre <laughs> cannabis plant out the other side. Now, I may have that beneficial, tra beneficial trait of not being able to be seeded, which in certain cases would be beneficial enough to plant it, right? But I think. You know, with triplets, you're going to get a spectrum and there needs to be some intentionality about what you're crossing, like what traits you're trying to stack and what like what the end product is going to be that you're shooting for. So I think I think you will see a lot of triplets come in the market. And I hope folks do a good job <laughs> with what they're releasing, because I think it it will benefit the industry. But, you know, if people just push stuff out and it's just mediocre, you know, it's going to get harder to get by on buy-in from growers specifically. And that's that's really who's, you know, growing and, and benefiting from the, especially the seedless trait uh, from Ploidy, uh, especially right. the triplets. I have a follow-up question to that. Um, when you're doing the breeding, are you seeing, because I know that other people who have been working with the triploids are seeing um, the tetraploids and the other things just show up in, like they're intentionally trying to breed for um, a triploid, but are ending up with tetraploids within that population. Are you seeing those sort of things happen? You, you, cannabis does some weird ploidy stuff. <laughs> yeah, and if you look enough, and I think this is true with all plants, so I don't think cannabis is necessarily, I shouldn't say all, most plants, right? So every once in a while, you'll just get something weird happen when, when all this stuff's recombining when it's making seeds. And so occasionally you'll get something weird pop out, right? And so exactly what you're saying, like that's how MAC1 just happened to be triploid from a, you know, maybe an unreduced gamete is possible, one of the possibilities. And so, you know, but trying to screen thousands of plants to find that one is a daunting challenge. And it's better, it's better to be able to have a come with a plan and, and know the crosses you want to make and do that sort of thing. And I think, you know, we're, we're focusing on triploids here, but like the next logical step is like haploid and double haploids as far as ploidy goes. So haploid would be just half, <laughs> one copy of each chromosome, right? And so you can think of that and a double haploid is just that one in double to make it to it, right? That's called a double haploid. That's what they use for breeding, you know, F1 seeds and all of ag, right? So you get a very homozygous individual in a very short amount of time. And so then you can really make truly seed production uh, viable cannabis crops. And so we've made a double haploid in our lab. We're very excited about that. Um, I think, you know, once we get into the the stage that we can breed in that double haploid background, we could really make some very unique, very um, uniform uh, performing crosses as well. Does anybody have a, uh, any more follow-up questions? I, I've got a really light one. Uh, Dr. Warren, are you using colchicine? Yeah, you can use colchicine. There's a bunch of different things that have been shown to work on uh, cannabis for the doubling of chromosomes. This is the most common thing used in, in plants to in, in, you know, do polyplay work. Okay. What type of product safety do you use around like when you're using the product? Yeah, of course. You can double human... <laughs> <laughs> like this is just a general, uh, you know, it arrests uh, the cell division and so it just keeps it from forming two cells. And so the, the double chromosome stays in one. Right. So, yeah, super got to be super safe. Wear gloves, uh, you know, so I don't want to be messing around with it uh, without proper safety. I think this is why I brought, bring this up. Right. So if you're working on your own and trying to do this, please be aware that um, you want to be super safe. Wear gloves. Um, and then please read the MSDSs on colchicine specifically because it, it does require some safe usage uh, parameters. Yes, and <laughs> colchicine is commonly used in people for uh, different sorts of uh, maladies like gout and some other things. So when I tell my, my friend, doctor friend <laughs> about these, he's like, what? So yeah, these chemicals are pretty interesting in, in life. They have many uses. I feel like I've talked to breeders in the past and it's funny because that's one of my top questions. I'm like, well, how do you deal with like the, you know, your, the, the safety of the people who are handling the things? And even with, you know, just basic feminization, you'd be very surprised also when people like, I'm like, how do you dispose of this stuff? Um, afterwards is a very interesting question, but that I had, I had one follow-up question just because it's something that's been on my mind because I'm, 
I'm just curious. I love like if plants, cause I've done, worked with a lot of seeds over the years and I feel like when things do freaky stuff, I'm always like, Ooh, even if it's not useful, I just want to see, <laughs> I'm like, Oh, that one looks like a truffula tree or why is it doing that? And obviously, you know, all the background of those things. But I guess my question is like between, um, diploids and all of the other ploidy world, what do you see in terms of like growth rate, um, plant height, just general, do you see differences in branching patterns or morphology in addition to like those chemical profiles? Like, are you seeing, um, you know, distinct differences? I think um, anywhere not enough there. that I want to go out on a limb for, but yes. So I think, you know, there's some data that suggests some of our crosses that triplets might finish faster. Uh, than the diploid counterparts. Um, some of them have like stronger like uh, stems and branches than the parents they, that they came from. And so this all has to come back and like gene dosage, right? So there's some gene dosage responses there when you have two of one and one of the other that are taking over. And so, you know, you often see, you know, like the, the tricots that'll sprout. And, you know, this is, I just bring this up because a lot of people when they see, you know, normally when you plant a cannabis seeds dicot, you'll see the two cotyledons, right? Occasionally you'll see three pop out and people think that's triplet. It's not. Uh, it's just uh, seeds do that. And there's like the world. Sometimes you'll see the, the world uh, node spacing on different seedlings. That's just unrelated. Um, but there's definitely, yes, the world. Thank you. <laughs> world phylotaxi. So on that. <laughs> And it's super cool to look at, right? And I think a lot of times it reverts back to the diploid state. So we are kind of interested like from a scientific perspective and why that happens, but I'm not sure if there's a commercial application for that yet. So we are getting to the halfway point. Does anybody have a couple more follow-up questions? I got one, I got one that's like my weird question. For, the, for this for this end uh, should I go for it okay so m my weird thing is 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 what's often spoken about and you know like I, I'm a really like I, I think you know we had a discussion the other day and and because science you know if you have to respond with something because and, and say because science I feel like it should be like one of those Pee Wee Herman moments and like the world should explode and it should be like yay like the word of the day for Pee Wee Herman was like if you should if you should have to say that then that's what should happen as as a consequence so you know that being said when people to start hearing about talking about you know messing with the genome or you know adding more DNA or more RNA or doing this that or the other they always get these these fears of are, are we going to do something to the plant that could get out and potentially destroy the cannabis plant as we know it you know like i'm just i hate to be that weird guy that asks the question but is that possible when doing these type of types of things or are we just fucking around and having some fun like it's, it's no big deal <laughs> you know what i mean like like that like to be all you know humble and ask my weird question to be honest well, it's like elizabeth Miller said you know you're not if you're not writing it down, it's not science. So I think as long as you're writing it down, everything's fine. No, but uh, I mean, it's a fair question, right? I think in the case of ploidy world, like this thing happens naturally in not only cannabis, but all plants, right? And so if there was some benefit to cannabis being tetraploid out in the wild, it would be tetraploid out in the wild, right? So I think, you know, just because it benefits us for being triploid, being seedless does not help it out in the environment, right? Uh, you know, maybe stack some terpenes in a certain way, it makes us feel a certain way, it doesn't really benefit it in nature, so to speak, unless it's providing some sort of insect, uh, you know, defenses or pathogen defenses. So I think these things happen naturally, especially ploidy in the world. And, you know, I think it's completely natural. I don't think there's anything here that's weird, anything untoward <laughs> that the folks working on this stuff are, are, are doing to, to cannabis specifically, in my, in my opinion. The rest of the, the panel might think differently. I don't know. Well, that's interesting. I haven't thought about it like that. I know we have to cut to break, but I, it does like make you ponder the thought of like, well, what are the downstream effects? All of a sudden my brain is like, well, what are the downstream effects? So, so like, right like, after the break, we're going like, to have a response to that. <laughs> and everyone's going to answer <laughs> like, the, the downstream events and everyone's going to respond too. So, 
So write it down because I might have already slightly forgotten. Uh, but we will be right back <laughs> in just a moment uh, with uh, words from nobody but our, ourselves, really, when it comes down to it. We'll, we'll, we'll check out this stuff. Or, or that's not the right intro. That's not the other cover. joking when uh, we finished off last time like I totally lost it right after <laughs> and now everything's gone gone and gone missing but Dr. Anubis wrote it down no, so no, I wrote we are it back. down I got it <laughs> yes team teamwork this is this is oh, and there's there's Evie so because of what we did we did say that Evie would go first but she's not quite there are you there no you want to do it, give it a moment <laughs> is that a so, no oh so, so <laughs> it dropped me. Sorry, I dropped my internet connection somehow. But I mean, I'm just more curious because I kind of feel like that would be a question that maybe would get asked by just the general. I mean, even with feminized people have had things over the years where, oh, it could cause these negative downstream effects to the just general cannabis population. So I'm really curious, you know, just from a it seems like that it's mainly a pro situation but when you think about like there's a lot of drama i think around like something with the seedless bananas and blah 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 i think you guys know what i mean but um just curious any thoughts there oh yeah i mean i think you know the i think the big issue with the seedless banana that everybody knows um 
you know, it's having a big disease issue because it's a uh, monoculture everywhere, right? It's the world's most popular banana. The name escapes my head uh, uh, for it. But, um, you know, and it's a species of fusarium and it's getting transmitted around the world. They're just running out of places to uh, grow this, this specific banana that everyone in the world loves, right? And, you know, funny story, it is, uh, it's a triple A banana. Um, and it was it occurred naturally, I believe. And, um, but just, it's, they have, don't have a lot of varieties that can match this on the market. So I don't think as, as, as a good show, like out in nature, it wouldn't survive very well because this pathogen kills it. <laughs> so it's a, it makes an example of the opposite, just because it's bred for a commercial trade people like, it doesn't mean it's going to change the dynamic of the natural crop. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Cavendish banana. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I love the banana story and I talk about it all the time. And there's even a song, which I won't play for you right now, but I have it on my Spotify. Um, but anyway, so yeah, that big Mike banana that used to be like the banana back in the day, it tasted like that fake banana flavor that we are all so used to. And we're like, that doesn't taste anything like bananas. It, I, it is the banana I flavor. I amyl acetate. Like, and there was a disease that came through and wiped out basically all of the big mics the gross uh michael i think was the other name for it um and we got the stupid cavendish banana that tastes like ass um so that's why that 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 fake banana flavor tastes nothing like bananas now but anyway yes that's the, the problem with the freaking monoculture is that if there's a de disease that comes through it hits everything equally because there's no genetic diversity genetic diversity is Diversity. It's key. Hashtag I'm a geneticist. I'm a little <laughs> <laughs> Do you wanna do you wanna add in there, Mark? Dr. Mark, we kind of gonna miss you there. Yeah, so isoamyl acetate is kind of like the essential oil of banana that's in all kinds of like, you know, banana flavored things. But I <laughs> I'll I had a, I had another thought that was completely perverted, and I'll just keep it to myself. <laughs> was it something about a big mic? No, it has, <laughs> it has something to do with another isoamyl compound. If if you've ever heard of it, but I we won't, we won't <laughs> well, go that there. Was that was my favorite organic chemistry lab. Was making that that particular is it an ester? Was the banana ester? Yeah. Oh, and, that was I, that's exactly what it is. And usually it is, it's an undergraduate experiment in usually doing distillation because you, you make the ester and then you usually distill it and you have to record its boiling point and then you usually smell it and it smells like bananas and I was like, the whole oh, class goes I'm bananas. Just I'm just kidding. That's not at all. But I really did like that, that lab. But I was going to go back to, um, I wanted to go back to Evian's point about like the downstream effects of polyploidy and i just wanted to uh so just to clarify polyploidy is not really messing with the genome so it doesn't really mess up any upstream or downstream genes because it's a whole extra set of chromosomes so if you have you know like humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes so we have 46 chromosomes if we were a triploid, we'd have another 23 chromosomes on top of that. We have another copy of every single chromosome. So it doesn't really mess up anything upstream or downstream, like, like something like a um, editing, like gene editing, like cutting and pasting and targeted, you know, editing does, which is what we do with things like CRISPR. Um, and uh, you know, that would be considered genetic modification. To me, I have a much broader definition of genetic modification, which would be anything that um, changes the natural evolutionary trajectory of something. So in that sense, every cannabis plant is um, a GMO and doing things like creating triploids is genetic modification, uh, selective breeding and, and uh, things like that is genetic modification. But if you are strictly talking like genetic engineering, uh, as far as I know, there's nothing really that's been successful in cannabis yet uh, because the genome's a mess. And yes, upstream and downstream effects are a thing. And so even when people do come up with these 
things they work okay in the lab but then you put it in the plant and it's like oh shit that didn't work so jeremy can you um since you're the plant guy <laughs> yeah i think so i think you know and technically crispr is not considered a gmo uh, for the united states of america and possibly europe um at least in the cases where it just it, you can produce something that would occur naturally is the, the case there, right? There could be a natural like single base mutation in a genome that would uh, cause an, a phenotype that we might like. And so I know there's groups in Israel that are talking and <laughs> maybe in Berlin now that have claimed they have done CRISPR work on uh, cannabis. So I'm interested to see what uh, comes of that. I'm also interested to see how, Cannabis reacts to the this sort of CRISPR and, and GMO work. I think, you know, at, at face value, there might be a lot of pushback uh, from the traditional growers and then people who are in the business. And then I think from a different set of folks, you might get the opposite and where it's like there's definitely some useful things, especially with limitations around pesticide use, uh, you know, ability to control certain pathogens and different uh, plant traits. So. I'm really interested uh, to see where cannabis lies in that sort of, you know, new age biotech uh, field. I don't know if you guys have heard anything else on the topic from either contacts or personally. No, don't want to talk about it. It'd be labeled a uh, Monsanto GMO person. It's fine too. <laughs> no, I, I I remember seeing back, and I think it was like, I want to say 2018 or 19, you know, way back in the day before COVID, um, there was a company that came out, uh, they had made a cannabis plant using gene editing that could produce water soluble cannabinoids, which is pretty, well, it was pretty exciting, but that was like four or five years ago. Where is it? <laughs> like, I feel like in the lab, a lot of things seem like they're going to work. And then when you put it into practice, either the plant doesn't deal well with it, you, you know, you can't scale up or whatever the case may be. So for me, like when people ask me about GMO, like Frankenweed, what's the state of, you know, where, where is it? Monsanto's all over Bay or blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you know, it's, it's a great idea. And, or, or at least, you know, it's, it's a big idea in people's brains that we're going to have all of this genetically modified cannabis, but in, like realistically, I think breeders actually do a much better job of pulling out potential traits than somebody in a lab with a pair of like gene scissors could ever do, in, in my opinion. No, it's a contentious topic for most, so uh, <laughs> it might be might be a different uh, discussion on a different show. But it's yeah, I think there's, you know, CRISPR technologies and their plants are just starting to come out now, right? So there is a bit of a R and D period, and I think you know, there are some good use cases for cannabis and CRISPR. Obviously, that's why companies are spending lots of money fundraising and doing that in, in the biotech matter. So I think we'll see them in cannabis for sure. Now, how they're accepted in the market, I um. I'm curious to see what, what we get. I have a question. Um, what about breeding? Like, so what if you, I have a two part question, actually. One part is, um, how are you seeing the propagation with the, um, with any of the ploidy plants? Like, is, are they propagating well? Are they handling TC well? Are they handling just basic propagation well? And I guess uh, I have another part to the question, but we could Obviously. It's a good, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, like once you get tetraploidin above, they grow slower. Um, so we see the same sort of reaction in tissue culture. I think triploid and, and below, they do about the same as diploid, right? So the, the double haploids, um, the standard two in cannabis and three in, those are all very similar in their growth patterns in TC and from seed. So there's not really a big there's no negative impact on being triploid compared to diploid if you're growing from seeds or in TC that we've seen. The other part of the question would be, um, so, you know, I'm just, because of my brain, obviously, I'm like more, I less am concerned and more just kind of playing devil's advocate in my head and contemplating what, um, you know, like what would happen if the, the triploids and like diploids started to do more interbreeding in the future Would that potential could that what would happen you know genetically what would happen could there be a potential for some sort of like infertility or 
the altered of the genetic traits, like compatibility, like what happens there? Is that, yeah. um, you so know. the, the, uh, triploids are pretty much sterile, right? So you can, they don't really make good pollen that you can hit on diploid plants to make crosses in general, right? Which it's, it's sort of like, uh, you know, in people where you, if you have a weird number of chromosomes, the outcomes aren't great for people, right? And the same thing is true with cannabis. So if there was, uh, opportunities on this like say you happen to get some diploid pollen on a triploid made a few seeds most of those seeds do not perform well and most of them just die like they're they're aneuploids is what you call them they don't have even numbers of chromosomes and they're not you know what we call fit <laughs> from a scientific perspective and they just go out and die so there's no chance of like the triploid uh there's not really a chance of triploid doing that to diploids because diploids will just be more more fit in, in nature. And so they'd always went out on the, the breeding battle because you'll make 3,000 seeds from one diploid cross on a plant. You might get two, you know, two to 50 from a triploid, right? So I think the chances of that happening and somehow diluting the, the genetics of cannabis is extremely low. And I don't think it's something we'll see uh, in the future. There's like, so like, all of a sudden, I don't know why my brain went to this, but I'm like, could we breed weed? Could we genetically engineer weed that makes us zombies? I don't know. There's some weird shit that could, could come out of it. There's, there's like 18 stoner questions. That That's called Delta 8, man. Yeah, Do you know how to make people like, zombies yeah. already? Because then we can answer your yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's called Delta it's, 8. That's Delta 8. <laughs> Come on, I got man. some hash that would do something that would get you pretty close. Um, but anyway, so I, I, I like to get into this. We've got the last little bit here. I'm going to give people an opportunity to ask questions from the audience if they want to ask questions. Um, but really, I, I want to ask, what do you what do you get into? What's your what's your day? What are you passionate about? What are you striving to do in your industry and space? What do you get excited about on a daily basis? What What's driving you forward in your career right now? Well, I'm, you know, I'm very interested in um, cannabis. I think, you know, I've mentioned this a couple of places, but I'm very interested in cannabis is like a molecular factory, so to speak, right? It's, it's one of the best plants we have at making uh, molecules. And as we go into the future, right, like all this reliance on petrochemicals, all this reliance on other things that, you know, people are really turning toward and like the old protein movement, you know, figuring out ways to make other things more sustainably and make them in plants, et cetera, right? And I think ca cannabis is a super, super good candidate for this to kind of take that next step for some of these these chemicals. And, uh, you know, it kind of leads to the next question that I wanted to have for Mark relating to this is, you know, we, and it's asked a lot of places, like, do we know a theoretical maximum for THC flower? And do we have a good way to determine what that might actually be? Well, it's directly correlated to trichome density, right? And, you know, we, we all know that the plant makes THCA. It doesn't make THC, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I was out in California last week visiting my son, and I went to the dispensary, and I bought some weed that was 43% THC. Right. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. 43, if it's 43% THC, do the math, divide that by 88%, and you're going to find out that that's like almost 50% THCA. I mean, you know, it's weird because uh, I live in Vermont, and Vermont's got a fucked up regulation in that they let growers basically bring samples to the lab for COAs for sale. Well, obviously, the growers can literally cherry pick their tops get a high THC number and then sell a bunch of booth that's from underneath that hardly, you know, fits that, that profile. So I don't know. I, I, you know, Anna might be better to answer this question because of her extensive work in looking at THC inflation and how that is impacting, you know, the sale of cannabis. I mean, I was in a dispensary here in Toronto today. I'm in Toronto for the ICRS and I went to a dispensary in Toronto and I started looking at some of the THC numbers in there. And certainly they're a lot lower here in Canada, um, Anna, than, they, than I would see like in an LA dispensary. But 
it's just it's so weird because the print is so fucking small that you almost need a magnifying glass to read it it's almost like they're just testing it just to get it through the system so they could get it into retail and i i don't really know i mean you, you know i think certainly testing for pathogens and pest, testing for harmful things is certainly a test that you know i think adds value but these overinflated potencies it's just absolutely ridiculous the more you're around cannabis the more you're realizing that there's no such thing as a 38 percent thc plant that's just total bullshit. and if it is 38 percent thc they've probably sprayed it with delta 8 before they brought it to the lab or something you know yeah, so there's, there's like, so much mishandling of cannabis it's hard to tell you know yeah Anna, maybe you have more input on this, but like, you know, there are actual plant parts involved in the flowers, like carbohydrates and uh, <laughs> cellulose and things like that, that are probably part of that percentage. Any, any thoughts? Well, so I think a lot about this. So when you think about it biologically, the plant has to do other functions just in order to survive um, beyond cranking out phytochemicals. And, you know, cannabinoids are just one sliver of the can of, of the phytochemicals that that cannabis produces and when when the plant is pumping all of this energy into making more chemicals what it's doing is an energy trade-off it's ignoring things like being able to fight off pathogens it's and you know with with almost half of the plant being oil like if you just think about that like anything that's half oil is going to be like an oily mess like the thought is and i you know no it hasn't been nothing in science is proven but the evidence seems to show that really beyond 35 percent total cannabinoids i mean that's about the limit uh beyond that the plant really isn't going to do very well it's not going to be able to function as a plant housekeeping uh you know functions aren't going to really go very well. So, so yeah, if you're seeing numbers upwards of 35, 35 is going to be rare, first of all. Um, and anything over that is pretty much going to be a bogus number. Either it's been adulterated or, you know, um, the lab is not being completely honest. You, there's tons of ways you can, you can inflate these numbers, but yeah, I would say, Top 35, which was going to be rare if you're walking to a dispensary and you've got like, you know, seven different strains that are all 35%. Like there's something going on there. You need to ask questions. Um, but I also think the oil production and storage is in the trichomes, right? So it's not actually in the cells of the cannabis plant. That's, and that's can, correct. You're correct. Cannabinoids are actually toxic to the cannabis plant. So they're going to keep it on the outside. So how big and how heavy can these trichomes get? Like, I, I don't know. I'm kind of, I'm almost, I'm almost sitting on the fence with this. Like, it's not really part of the plant. They're not in the cells. They're not, you know, like the cell, the, the plant is producing these. If they're just pushing them into the trichomes and storing them, yeah, you're going to have a big oily mess. But perhaps the way our, what we're thinking of is not really i don't know i don't know i'm yeah, on the it's, it. it's a hard question to answer which is why i think no one's done the work right like it's a, there's a physical limitation to the size of the trichome before it starts spilling everywhere and falling mm -hmm. off the water right so that compared to the weight of the actual file which is pretty light without water well, i'm just curious if you know a chemist could decide <laughs> do some work uh, figure out what the real max is so we can stop beating around the bush <laughs> with everybody well, saying if we could get it federally legalized so that actual like places of, of research such as academic institutions would do most, you know, the research that gets published that we share, you know, if we get that happening, that'd be pretty cool. Maybe we could answer some of these well, big, big questions that we need to know. <laughs> I think also if, if, legal, if legalization happens and people aren't pressed at a dispensary, you know, again, the mentality and the psychology of the dispensary purchases, I'm in here. I'm already getting ripped off, so I'm going to get the most I can possibly get, so I need a high THC number. I think that's a ridiculous thing, but I, I think indirectly that impacts saleable flour 
in the shop and 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 thus impacts the wholesale price to the producer i mean i think if right? you're going because through flour if you're, buy, if you're, buy you're a sitting next flour, to a if you're going through flour buy a great quality flour that smells good looks good whatever and if you want to you know bump it up in thc percent because that's your jam then buy a concentrate and add that like ugh. yes <laughs> yes, exactly what Anna said. <laughs> Buy a concentrate because that requires chemistry. And when you when you concentrate the oil, it's just a completely different beast altogether. Um, I was just going to ask Jeremy something about our favorite molecule, Delta-8. You know, um, uh, I'm here at ICRS in Toronto, and uh, we presented a paper this morning. When I say we, it's uh, Dr. Alan Hallett from uh, 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 Wake Forest down in, in uh, North Carolina. And what we what we presented this morning is that the major byproduct that's formed in Delta-8 is actually active in neuronal signaling, similar to cannabinoids, but it has a different profile, and we don't know if it's hitting CB1 receptor. But the question I, I have for you is, um, um, have you ever seen a flower COA that contains Delta-8 THC? For flower, I'm not for a, a concentrate. Or distillate. Yeah, on a flower, I have I have to go back and look. I don't think so. Um, it'd be interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think. The, yeah, I, I think the answer is no because I am going out on a limb here, and I'm thinking that delta eight does not occur in cannabis. It occurs in the HPLC vial that you're sampling that cannabis with, because. All that has to happen in order to get isomerization is just a little bit of energy because it's only a couple kcals in difference, but because it's going thermodynamically downhill, it's favored. So a little bit of decarboxylated THC could isomerize from delta nine to delta eight. Because I talked to a couple experts who've been in this field for a lot longer than I have, and I said, "Does the plant make delta eight cannabinoids?" And they said, "No. The enzyme does not make any mistakes. It's only delta nine configured." But you, these hemp hustlers have to stick to the notion that delta eight occurs naturally in cannabis, so they can feel good about going to sleep at night, because that market sector, from what I understand, after talking to somebody who sat on a Cal or a Colorado task force, is worth five billion dollars. Billion with a B which dwarfs the entire combined regulated cannabis market. So this is what's happening as, as a function of cannabis prohibition and the farm bill. So I was just wondering in your all your work, have you ever seen Delta 8 in flower? I've never seen it in flower, and I don't I believe that, Delta 8 exists in flower. I'm going to go double check uh, all of our COAs, but uh, I know they and a lot of our labs will check for it. Um, and it's on the list, but I, I would imagine if there was any picked up, I think it's similar to what you say. It's not, it'll be a low volume and not directly from the plant. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, look back. I mean, you know, never know what you might find. <laughs> I, I really like to speak from, from knowledge on that. So I've looked at literally thousands of COAs. I've never seen it in plant material. So um, I just wanted to know in all of your work, if you've ever seen it, if you ever do, please do correspond. I'd, I'd like yeah, to know I'll that. check them out. It's pretty easy for me to look at back at a bunch of them. Thank you. Awesome. Well, we're coming down to the last few minutes of the episode. I haven't seen a lot of questions come through. Does any of our esteemed panelists have any further questions? Evian's got her hand up, ready to go. Oh, I just think, I'm, Jeremy, I really appreciate your kind of innovation and where you're headed. And I guess I was pondering this last little chunk, like what is exciting for you in the future with cannabis or like where are things that like um, beyond what we've spoken to, you know, like where are the parts that are um, fascinating in addition to this? Because it seems like you're up to some pretty interesting things. Well, I think, you know, we're, we're very excited about seeds, you know, stable seed lines, F1 seeds and cannabis. Um, and I think to go along with that, for those to be successful is we really do need a better understanding. And especially as we're going on this line of, you know, the, the triploids with different, you know, whatever designer weed with different, uh, terpene profiles that are, you know, kind of curated is getting a better understanding of how that would affect people when they smoke it. Right. Cause, cause at the end of the day, those are the people buying it and they're buying it for that exact reason. So, 
um, you know, being able to bridge that gap from making those discoveries in the lab and being able to get them in people's hands to try, you know, to kind of validate the, the thought process we have is, is kind of the next thing I want to tackle uh, from our R&D group. Is, is, is there a big push, you know, I, I've seen this in, in, in pharmaceuticals, in biotechnology in general. I mean, there's descriptive genomics, right? And so there's understanding the genes and understanding, you know, what, what, what they do. But really in, in the functional genomic space, I mean, do we know what genes are responsible for certain traits that are desirable? And could there be studies to look at like what upregulates those genes and could that be like an area Absolutely. of fruitful research yeah that's a big part of what we do especially on the grower side as far as phenotypic traits I mean, there's a lot of companies in cannabis looking you know look cannabis isn't unique in its own island right it's still a ag crop so there's tons of research you can go look over in wheat and strawberries and corn for disease resistance traits and find those same genes in cannabis and make the, oh yeah, there's a good chance it could happen in cannabis with the same sort of gene. So let's look for that and see the effects in cannabis. So there's lots of people working on those things. I think what isn't clear is once you get back beyond the agronomic traits, right? There's some ideas around terpenes and the effects they have, but there's a ton of chemicals that cannabis makes that we don't know about. And, you know, it's exciting. We've figured these out over the next few years and being able to quickly identify those in strains and breed for them and get products out to meet specific needs, you know, that those chemicals unknown to us now, but will be provided in the future, I think is very exciting. Yeah, I would think things like insect resistance, drought resistance. I mean, these are always going to be traits that I think growers will constantly be interested in. So if we know what turns on those genes, that can be pretty valuable research for the entire community. Absolutely. So I love I love our 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 audience <laughs> and I can't I can't get the whole question on there, but I got a doozy for the last one of the evening. And this will be our last big quest. So genetically modified microorganisms show a significantly lower cost for scale production in cannabinoids. It's likely that uh, where the cash for RNA swap for the plant material to Dan's point and this point earlier. Any knowledge on companies in the US doing this? Last research I did led me to do, into genetic companies and labs in Germany, New Brunswick, and British Columbia. I predict blah, 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 so on and so forth. We, we have some, we, we, we have a pretty elite following. We get like uh, quite a bit of views, um, but we have the, the biggest nerds in the world and I appreciate the hell out of them. So <laughs> yeah, 100% yes. Uh, there are companies doing this. Uh, the name escapes me. There's one here in California that's doing this exact thing that made, uh, I think, you know, THC and CBD, and I think they're doing it in yeast. Um, I think currently that model is projected straight for medicinal use, uh, pharmaceutical use, so that the, you know, the all the federal regulations on the safety of those chemicals, right? Because there's a lot of hurdles you have to do to use those crops from the field, like pollen and all the allergens mainly that the FDA is going to want to make sure you prove it safe if you're doing that sort of pharmaceutical extract from a cannabis plant. So I think right now, as far as I know, the, the production costs are cheaper than the field. It's, it's often hard to beat plants in a field on this. And the last update I'd heard is it's not currently cheaper for them to make it, but it's the cheapest pharmaceutical grade uh, stuff you can get. Maybe the only technically <laughs> pharmaceutical grade, maybe Mark or Anna, you have thoughts on that? Well, I think if you can grow in a cannabis plant, it doesn't need to be made by yeast. That is strictly a money commodity play. And what I can tell you is that, you know, um, cannabinoids are very hydrophobic, right? And so if you're going to be uh, making that in an aqueous broth, good luck on getting a decent titer. Titer is like how many milligrams per liter you can make in a fermentation. So if you talk to these guys like the Celebre guys or the uh, there's a lot of people who are doing this right now, Ginkgo Works and all that, you know, OK, so what are they going to get? They're going to get a few milligrams out of a couple hundred liters. OK, so somehow if you come up with these huge 10 story tanks and you put 10 of them next to each other, you could output what uh, a greenhouse of a bunch of plants puts out. Give me a break. You know, I think going after rare cannabinoids like THCV 
could be good. But I can tell you that the enzymatic, so the, in the enzymatic pathway to make cannabinoids, uh, you have altolvic acid uh, reacting with something called, uh, 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 it's, a, it's a prenal transferase. It's called GOT. It's called, uh, GOT stands for something, uh, uh, geranial uh, altolvic transferase. So that enzyme is the one that makes CBGA. That's an incredibly slow membrane bound uh, um, uh, enzyme that it, it just, it's not very productive. So they're having a very difficult time doing that. Fortunately, people have worked out chemistry, <laughs> God, chemistry to basically put on that prenal group and to do it in a very stereo or very regio selective way. Um, but I, I just, I, I don't think for making THC and CBD that fermentation is going to ever come up against hemp and cannabis. But for the rares, like if you want to make THCP or if you want to make THCV and you can't come up with a high variety plant, then maybe fermentation is the answer to make those rares. But, you know, that's just my opinion. Um, I would agree. I don't think there's any reason why any yeast or other organism should be made to make THC and CBD when the plant does it just fine in large quantities. Um, potentially some of the miners, but again, those can be made in a lab, but if you really want them to be natural, sure, let's go with, you know, another organism. But, you know, that comes with a whole lot of cleanup too. Like we have to clean up, if you want an extract, if you want to isolate to go into, let's say pharmaceuticals, sure. Like you could have these, microorganisms make one specific thing but it turns out from what i've read that these microorganisms are branching off and making other cannabinoids that we haven't even seen in cannabis yet like they're doing their own thing uh yeah and then there's the cleanup too so you know you still have to like isolate it it's not just oh here put some yeast and some medicine and like we still have more steps just like we do with cannabis so i don't know like whatever i think it's um one of one of this and one of that like yeah maybe speed to production damon that's a good point like what? weird question could you use modified yeast to make bread that produces cannabinoids potentially i think that's a really good um Question, London. Why not? <laughs> the answer is yes, if no, you wanted we to. Gotta, we got to cut that part out. We got to cut that part out so nobody knows that that was said because we just we just discovered something you just truly. Ruined We're your... baking bread to THC. It's going to be the greatest Listen thing. Send your treats. You can put you, anything that you bake. Ooh, now baked goods have a I, whole I new I will meal. bring getting baked <laughs> to a whole Good. new level. Yeah. <laughs> London cut this whole thing out. You've got to put that on stage. Good. That's hilarious. That's too good. Okay, well, we are at the end of the episode. We have one last final big question that we always like to ask our guests during these these fun times. Beer too. This is this is it's genius. Um, how do we support you, Jerry? Like, how do we how do we go check out? How do we support Dark Heart? How do we support what you're doing? How do we check out what you're doing? How do we do that? Like, where do we find you? How that type of stuff? Um, because you know, it's you're doing the good work. We yeah. want to support the community. Definitely, yeah. I mean, we can always we have our website up, uh, darkheartnursery.com. Always hit us up there. You can hit up our lab email, lab at darkheartnursery.com for any questions. I monitor that as long as a bunch of other people in the Lab do as well. Richard Philbrook's going to talk on Ploidy at the Cannabis Conference in Las Vegas here coming up in August. So if you want to learn more about that, please come check it out. Um, but yeah, we're always open to, for discussion. My LinkedIn, I'm pretty good about checking that every couple of days. So if you have any specific questions, feel free to reach out. We're always looking to talk to people, work together. Um, any, any partnerships, we're always open to seeing if anything, you know, chat and see anything hits the wall and we can work on stuff together. So please, please feel free to reach out. 
we've we've got all the fun weird people. Well, thank you all for coming on to the show. Thank you, Ryan. Brian really liked the way that I asked that question. I thought I was pretty eloquent with it myself too. Um, uh, I appreciate you all, and we look forward to having you back in not next week because it's America Day, and it's the Canada Day in the period there too. And so it's the America Day and the Canada Day. So celebration um and such so yeah no want to click don't they don't pay money for there you go there the a cannabis excise tax stamp cost a buck per per bag doesn't matter what size it's ridiculous it's per a seed. cool looking one, stamp too i want to one dollar a seed a seed excise uh, tax per seed for 10 pack of seeds cost 10 bucks put out cost that's just in tax just saying it's crazy I um, love Canada. anyway I it's love so Canada. fucking weird man we should get together since you're there and smoke some of bubble man stuff on his channel with him well, and just be like oh well, dude I, this is not the greatest just a bug i'm really bad or something really. I, I'm, 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 no, gonna come back and visit you, okay? I'm gonna come back and visit you london well I, i'll be in croatia on july 23rd so oh, we've got to make it quick yeah. we got to make it quick or i got to come down and visit you but anyways Cheers, everybody. Wave, and we'll say bye and see you next time on The Dank Hour. Mm -hmm.